thank you. Um, okay, now, do I have like a clicker? So I'm going to um, focus in the next 20 minutes on uh, biodiversity data. And um, so to tackle this biodiversity crisis, you know, we all know how important biodiversity is. So to, to do this, um, we, we need data, right? We need to know what biodiversity we need to protect. We need to know where it is. We need to know um, how things are changing, right? It, it's crucial. We, we, we can't tackle this crisis without data. And so um, I'm going to cover an approach to a more, essentially a data-driven way of collecting data um, and talk about a particular type of um, biodiversity data that has immediate impact on human health. So... Um, it's a bit of a it's a bit of a cliche. It's a very overused phrase that uh, people people say data is the new oil, right? Um, um, it's a, it's an analogy that people use. You know, data powers things. Data, data is a powerhouse. It powers research. It powers our economy. Things like this. But it's not the it's not the most kind of constructive and and, and pleasant analogy because. Oil has lots of really nasty side effects as well. Um, you know, pollution, um, uh, uh, geopolitical instability, and the like. Um, maybe a, a better and more constructive um, analogy with, with oil is, is its ability to, to lubricate, to, to reduce friction. And um, thinking about um, kind of data and, and, and lubricating this process is something that we've been doing for a decade now at, uh, at GigaScience, GigaScience Press. Um, so um, it, we launched our first journal in 2012, um, and really with the, the, the to, to, to try to make this process of sharing data uh, much easier, to, to, to reduce the friction in this whole process. Um, incentivizing people to share by um, creating a, a, a type of article, a data note that gives people a means and, and credit for doing this hard work, and also trying to make this process as easy as possible by having our own uh, data repository and data team on hand to help researchers to, to share their data. So, and, and this is through our GigaDB database. And um, so in the last decade, we've been quite happy with uh, how this has gone. And, um, and so we've been working in this area of open science, really, open data, open science. And it's great that in the, this has really become mainstream now. Um, in, at the end of 2021, UNESCO um, uh, signed, the, you know, members of UNESCO, uh, nearly 200 uh, na nation states and jurisdictions ratified this and made a pledge to fulfill the human right of access to science. Um, and so, you know, yes, th th this is going to now be brought into policies and practices of, of um, you know, nation states around the world. And uh, one really good thing that this report did was it really defined what open science is and it came up with four different pillars, um, uh, open science knowledge, open science infrastructures, open engagement of societal actors, and open dialogue with other knowledge systems. And we took this as an opportunity for our 10th birthday to really kind of map and see what we've been doing at open science in, in the last uh, decade. And all of our focus, it seems, was in the area of open science knowledge and open science infrastructure. That, they're working with data repositories, licensing, all of these open tools that we would integrate into the process. But we realized we haven't done such a good job on these other two fundamental pillars of open science, the engagement of societal actors. We've um, you know, taken, participated in, in IHM and, and citizen science projects, for, for example, but open dialogue with other knowledge systems is really, really difficult. There are big barriers, particularly the cost, the language, the way that you communicate science. And we realize that this is, for the ne our next decade, this is the area we really need to focus on. And, um, uh, and, and, and it, it kind of validated a lot of the thinking in, in our last few years that we've tried to address these particular tricky issues through, um, through technology. So through launching a new uh, publishing workflow, um, working with this company, River Valley Technologies, we have um, helped them create a completely new uh, publishing platform and workflow that actually addresses some of these 
remaining barriers. Um, it does everything uh, in purely in XML. And this um, helps it to break down, uh, be much cheaper, more interactive, and do uh, interesting things with language and the way that you view papers. Um, because the production process is automated, something that takes traditionally a month or so, we can now do this in a matter of hours. Humans just need to kind of check some of the pagination. Um, that reduces the cost. It allows parallel proofing of different languages. And, um, and also interactivity. Um, so to show some of the examples and workflows in the sort of data, data publishing process, uh, data collecting process, um, and, and to show how this is relevant to biodiversity. So this was a great paper couple of published a couple of years ago about species, where the species are in the world, right? Where is all of the species richness? And so red is, is, is uh, if, if you look at the, the top map, red is where, the, where all of the, the species are, right? The most richness is in this kind of middle zone of the world. Um, in, and um, you know, this is where most of the biodiversity is. But unfortunately, in terms of completeness of biodiversity records, in, in terms of where all of the data is, there's just a big gap in the middle, right? So gray and blue is just missing is just lacking data so there's a there's a huge data gap here that you know the most diverse places have proportionally the least data and we need to we need to tackle this gap um, and in 1999 uh, OECD created this organization uh, GBIF the global biodiversity information facility um, based in Copenhagen with me uh, member states across the world this plan to be the, the kind of gathering place for all of this uh, biodiversity data. Um, and they have literally billions of records now. Um, and it's a sort of database of databases. Um, databases feed into this, and they have it's a, one, a kind of one-stop portal for all of the world's biodiversity information. Um, but even in this map, you can see there are gaps, right? There's, there's, there's big dark green areas where, where data is missing and when you set up something like this you, you have to start filling filling the database up and so from the very beginning they have focused on targeted data mobilization efforts so initially when you set this thing up you you work with the with the museums you work with the herbariums you work with all of the global collections the um uh, you know, ac ac academics and, 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 and governments and museums. So this was the kind of initial data um, that, that has filled it up. Um, but this is historical, right? This is, we've done a good job now filling it with stuff from the past, but we need to look at the present and the future. How do you get real-time uh, new data? How do you fill it, fill all of the gaps in these collections? Um, you can use citizens, which is great. Um, and so there are um, more and more platforms, people using uh, mobile phone apps to ca capture and collect um, data of, of species. And the two really big ones globally are iNaturalist, a Nat, Ge uh, Nat Geo uh, app that measures all kinds of biodiversity, and eBird. The bird watchers are just out there and collecting more data than anybody else. Um, but this then uh, is, is validated. Once it gets sufficient validation, it becomes research grade, and, and then it feeds into the GBIF database. Um, and this is now the biggest source of data, is actually this citizen-collected research grade data. So this fills lots of areas. It's a bit biased to things like birds. Um, but this, is, this has been a, a really useful data stream. But there are still other really important areas that we need to fill these gaps. And so uh, a really new approach to this are um, that, that GBIF and other organizations have been started to promote our um, sponsored series of data publications, right? So you identify an area geographically or by taxa that we need data from this. And then you reduce the friction even more by Basically, a, 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 a small donation, a funder will just put a small amount of money, and that covers the publication costs and other, and other costs. So um, to date, there's been a, a number of these from uh, the B Bulgarian publisher Pensoft. They've targeted, um, for example, the big gap from, from Eurasia, right? The data from Russia, 
um, and the former Soviet republics, northern Eurasia. Um, they published a huge amount of data came through one of these data mobilization schemes. They've also looked at different biomes, right? And, and what, are, what are really useful biomes to get data? So um, currently there is an open um, uh, call for um, soil biodiversity data. Um, Fred, Fred has a big interest in this. Uh, area, but it's um, about organisms that spend at least one stage of their life in soil. There's a big shortage of this data. Um, freshwater data, we all need to know, you know, how clean our water is. Um, and the Journal of Limnology from Page Press has done one of these data mobilization calls on um, species that live in fresh water, for example. So um, with our Gigabyte Journal, we've now got in this space and we participated in a call um, very generously sponsored by the World Health Organization, um, who have covered all of the costs, um, and um, in partnership with TDR and GBIF. And the area of data that we focused on um, are disease ve vectors of human diseases, right? So these um, are kind of... Um, uh, th this is an area of biodiversity that has huge impact on, on public health. Um, another thing we did to reduce friction is that WHO have, have um, helped pay for a, a help desk for a... Um, so on top of the costs going down, there's also extra people on hand to help people uh, share this data, which may be a bit tricky. And so anybody who wants to share this public health data, you email health at gbif.org, and then there's somebody on the end of this help desk who will help you share it. And so the kinds of things that we're, that, that we're looking at are, you know, mosquitoes, um, ticks, um, sand flies that, that um, uh, cause diseases that affect a huge number of people on, on the planet. Um, the, you know, a quarter of all infectious diseases are these, are come from these um, disease vectors. And again, if you see, it's this big central band in the, you know, the most biodiverse but less studied part of the world that, that are most affected by these, um, by these diseases. So this is why we need this data, right? This is why it's so important. Um, and um, so to give some examples, um, uh, we got a number, so in this first call, we got a number of papers from Latin America and we got a lot of them on sand flies. Um, so Leishmaniasis is a really nasty uh, tropical disease. Um, it can have cutaneous, uh, mucocutaneous or visceral forms, the visceral one particularly nasty and potentially fatal. Um, and these tiny little sand flies will bite you, and then if you don't kind of deal with it, um, it can, can lead to these horrible diseases. Now, the majority of them, again, are in this sort of uh, middle zone of the world, um, uh, North Africa, Middle East, and uh, South America particularly um, badly affected. Brazil, for example, has the worst um, uh, visceral and second worst cutaneous uh, n numbers of people infected by like this, right? So tiny little flies can have a, like a big, big impact on public health. Um, and um, Brazil yeah, has very high levels of this, and uh, particularly in the northern Amazonian region, uh, has about half of these. They do um, disease surveillance and monitoring to try and find, you know, and tackle the sand flies, but remote areas, how do you do this, right? How do you do public health programs in the remote parts of the Amazon? And back in 2010 to 2012, there were, there were, they, it was discovered that there were some of these leishmaniasis outbreaks in some of the most remote parts of Brazil. Um, these two ethnic groups, there's very, very few of them. The Wahapi, there's about just over a thousand individuals. The Surawaha, there's only 170 individuals right on the border of like Brazil and right at the very end of the Amazon. And public health workers um, went into the field, worked with these local communities and did proactive field work, collecting this occurrence data and trying to figure out why, why they suddenly are getting this disease. So um, a decade on, they've written this up, shared this data publicly. There's about nearly 5,000 records coming from these indigenous lands. And they actually found interesting things that this increase in leishmaniasis was actually because they only, um, they changed their hunting pra uh, practices um, uh, at that time because they got their first access to flashlights. They started hunter gathering in the, at night time for the first time. They're bitten more by the flies. They get more of these diseases, right? It was actually really useful. 
um, working hand in hand with the communities to kind of figure these things out. And this paper um, highlighted that it may be of particular importance to balance scientific knowledge with indigenous knowledge to improve health surveillance activities and adapt these to different eco-social contexts with the participation of indigenous people who better know their ter territories. So this is like, you know, state-of-the-art data collection, but actually working with um, indigenous groups and cr creating indigenous knowledge and um, improving public, he public, public health. Um, all sponsored as well, you know, incentivizing sharing so people can use this model in other parts of the world. Um, so I mentioned that we have this state-of-the-art platform. Other things that it allows us to do is interactivity and uh, multilingualism. So hopefully, if I click this, will the video work? So um, because we can do parallel translation, you can click a button and change it to Portuguese version of the paper. It's linked to uh, Portuguese language uh, preprints. Um, and um, it also has uh, interactive content, so the actual maps where the data is in South America are embedded in the paper and can pop out, so people can understand this much better. Um, the fact that it's actually in language that people in Brazil can understand, um, talking to the authors of this particular paper, they said most of these field workers unfortunately don't speak English. Actually having the paper that can also be read in Portuguese makes it so much more relevant and useful to them. Um, and um, then uh, the data, is, the, the paper is then shared with PubMed Central, this big global repository of, of publications. And PMC actually, because we put the alternative languages in the XML, they will, ha they will publish the multiple versions so anybody can find and actually read this um, in English and in Portuguese on the, on the PMC platform, um, which people really are not using this functionality. The series as well um, uh, was, was a great way to also engage uh, you know, societal actors. Um, so this Mosquito Alert project was one that where um, we actually, uh, through Fred, met uh, 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 teachers at the CFS school in Hong Kong. We mobilized their kids to go out around Hong Kong taking pictures of potentially dengue carrying mosquitoes. This data is then integrated into their platform and through this sponsored call, it was easier for them to share the data from this platform into GBIF um, and they uh, published a, a paper that had um, about 30,000 observations and 40,000 images of the mosquitoes that will make, you know, be useful for kind of people designing mosquito detection algorithms and the like. And it was very interesting that it, they, they had to come up with a way to credit the, the team members of the Mosquito Alert, the, um, the validate, expert validators who are professional entomologists, and also the people who gathered the data, the citizens, right? They are all credited in this paper, and it kind of helped them really think about how they need to kind of credit and feed back to the, to the sources of the data as well. Um, so in total, this first call, we um, got about half a million occurrence records of over 675,000 specimens, mosquitoes, sandflies, ticks, um, and kissing bugs. Um, have, like half the submissions were from Latin America, but data came from 50 countries around the world, all open. Um, we got observations, uh, specimen collections, imaging data, DNA barcodes, and this citizen collected data as well. And um, there's an umbrella paper that we've published in Giga Science kind of explaining the, the you know, lessons learned from all of this. And the WHO was so happy that they've just opened a second call, so we're taking uh, submissions again. Um, now, I appreciate there's not going to be many medical entomologists in the room uh, who would be interested in such a call, but I hope this approach helps people appreciate um, uh, that this, this is a way to, to gather data, right? That, that there may be areas that you, that you, you know, you, you realize there's a data shortage, and so these targeted, sponsored data mobilization calls are cheap and easy way to kind of just Get, get a bunch, you know, get a bunch of data in these, like, crucial gaps. Um, and, and coming back to this sort of data and oil analogy, like, this is a really, maybe a, a better analogy and, 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 and way of thinking about data is data has the potential to heal. This, this data helps communities, you know, 
target exactly where where these problems with these sand flies were right o oils can you know be you know can be healing balms they can be essential oils and nutrients and 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 so we you know here's a really nice example where where data can kind of like help heal and fix things and um so I would just like to thank, uh, you know, TDR and WHO for sponsoring this effort um, and covering the co covering the publication costs. And um, I don't know if we have time for questions, but we're going to have a discussion. Um, but uh... all right, thank you.